All right, great. Sorry. I'll, I swear I won't do that all night. Um, yeah, hi guys. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to see you all. Um, I've come over from London uh, today for this, um, just just for you. So, uh, woo. <laughs> yeah, when, when Simon invited me over, um, I was under the impression there was going to be some sort of boxing match. That's what the, the tech guys do these days, um, either for just your entertainment or to decide who goes first. But I guess they just assumed I'd win. Uh, I assumed David was going to be late again. So. Ooh. <laughs> Shot, man. I swear there's only four dunks on Axum in this talk. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, what I always talk about is crates and like specifically library crates um, because I think I've got a good amount of experience at this point both in open source and uh, internally at my workplace developing libraries for Rust and the conclusions I've come to uh, might be obvious to some but uh, I think the expectations for a library crate change as you scale up. So I want to talk about that today. It's a bit more of an art form than a science from what I understand, and this lovely picture generated by Bing AI uh, demonstrates that quite well. Um, give it a go, it's sometimes horrifying. So I think when you're developing Rust, most of the time you're developing applications or binaries, front ends, um, or you know, web services or something, and that represents what the user you know, sees and interacts with. Um, but developing libraries is a bit more like you know flipping the flipping the watch around and seeing seeing the innards and you have to organize all this mess of cogs and how they fit together and you know how big are they and, and stuff like that. Um, so why me? Why can I talk about this? Well, um, yeah, I've got a, a few crates that I own and you know not to brag, but Tiny Map has two hundred downloads a month. Um, some other things you might have heard of uh, these crates. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a whole it's a whole collection. I think when I took over Actix, it was something like twenty crates, which we slimmed down to sixteen, and it's back up to twenty for whatever reason at this point. But yeah, it's uh, you get experience um, both to figuring out how to create a library that works for people uh, you know, at my workplace, and also how to like, link all these things together in nice ways. Because um, I think crates are really like, are, are cool, like cargo, right? Who likes cargo? <laughs> Isn't that a good tool? Right, it's probably one of the best parts of Rust. Like, the tooling is just phenomenal. Um, and being a separate tool, uh, a separate um, thing from the Rust compiler is probably something that gets lost because it's so easy to use and the front end is just, uh, it's, it's the only thing you interact with, basically. Um, it's doing a lot of heavy lifting, though. Like when you run Cargo, Cargo Run, it's 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 doing this like crazy thing, which you can see by passing like verbose flags into Cargo Build, and um, that's just like the minimal. This is an empty like basic uh, target. When you add in dependencies, it's doing all this. But um, if we zoom in on a little bit of the the bottom part here, these extern. Uh, arguments here. These are all your dependencies and they're pointing to some files in, in the file system but it also has to do this run for every other dependency of these dependencies etc etc. It's a remarkable tool and we don't even have to mess around with make files or webpack which is just famously annoying to configure. Who's configured webpack before? All right? Isn't cargo easier than that? Don't you just love it? <laughs> um, I think the, also to say, like maintaining a Rust library uh, in the open source world is very, very much easier than trying to maintain a bunch of make files for C targets and stuff like that. Just because Cargo is nice, and the ecosystem we built around Cargo is nice. Crates, IO, uh, docs to RS. It's a beautiful place to work. Um, one of the big wins that we get for free with Cargo is semantic versioning. And I think Cargo has a slightly different flavor to the official uh, spec, but um, let's say you've just created a library. You need to start following semantic versioning immediately. Always, 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 always. Um, because it matters. Like Cargo assumes that this is how, how you're doing it. Uh, I mean, quick primer, I mean, from left to right, major, minor patch versions. Um, and again, like Rust itself, Cargo itself, and most libraries on Crates.io do this. They adhere to it. Um, the ones that don't, 
which I've seen, we shout at them uh, because when we run cargo update, everything breaks and we say, you can't just match your versions with your equivalent Java libraries. I'm sorry, it doesn't work like that here. Uh, insert Jav Chadwick Boseman meme. I can't believe I didn't think of that. <laughs> um, something that gets lost a little bit actually is that the version that you put inside your cargo manifest is not a version, it's a minimum version requirement. And that has some implications on what versions are compatible with that requirement, which we'll talk about in a sec. Uh, if you're not quite at version one, which um, most crates aren't, the semver versions are kind of shifted to the right, depending on how many zeros there are between these versions. So bumping semver, like, one of the beautiful things is that you can really understand between two versions what the changes are between those two versions. If there's only a patch difference, it's probably just bug fixes or doc updates or some boring stuff that you just need a new version for. If, um, if there's a minor bump, there's probably something new in the API that you might care about. Um, myself, when I run cargo update, I look through the list and have a look for minor versions and go check out the changelog, see what's new. It might be, uh, might be some cool stuff that you, um, that you can use. If you're bumping the major version, what you're indicating is that there's some manual intervention needed. Like cargo update won't break things for you, even if there's like a higher version. And uh, yeah, so we can have a, a little quick quiz here. And the format of this is on the left, there'll be the version requirement. On the right, there'll be a version. And the question is, is that version compatible with the requirement? So. Question one, hands up for it's compatible, basically. Yeah, of course it is. Uh, what about this one? Also, yes, good. Guys at the back, come on. Uh, so this guy, yep, minor versions can be bumped when it's version one, of course. Great. Uh, this, no hands, beautiful. Great. Uh, what about this guy? These compatible? No, no hands, good. Uh, what about this one? We talked a little bit about pre, pre V1 stuff. Um, so actually, no, this is, this is not. So this is what we mean by shift, uh, shift assembly versions right one. So the uh, ignore the left zeros, and now the, uh, the middle numbers are what you care about, and they are different and effectively represent major versions here. Uh, what about this guy? Compatible or no? Tricky one, it looks compatible, but actually it isn't. And to be fair, this doesn't really make too much of a difference because you very rarely see crates this low uh, in versioning. Uh, but yeah, just a little, little gotcha there. Um, that one's pretty obvious. All right, we haven't talked about pre-release versions, but is this, this compatible? Some, some people racking their brains. No, it is not, good stuff. Uh, about this guy? Does that surprise anybody? So all pre-release versions are compatible with each other. Um, with our newfound knowledge, what about this one? You guys are loving this quiz, aren't you? <laughs> Actually, yeah. Um, turns out uh, everything alphanumerically above the version requirement is also compatible, which is a real gotcha if you've got uh, lots of pre-release crates depending on each other, which you know users of the V4 of Actix Web will remember with fright. Uh, that doesn't work, no. No, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure it's alphanumeric alpha ordering. Uh, so, what about this one? Going from a pre-release to a stable V1 version. Yes, it is. This gets a lot of people. Um, you don't come across this very often, but there you go, that was a bit of fun. So, all right. Yeah, shoot. How many questions did you get about this when you learn all the previous Look. <laughs> Look, there were some mentions on r slash rust jerk. That's, that's how many. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, too many, dude. All right, so we're going to start the journey from I have an idea for a library. I want to publish it in open source land. We have zero downloads. Sad times. Write tests. 
We all know this, but write tests. And I came across this quote quite recently, actually. Uh, if it's not tested, it's broken. Not it might be broken, it is broken. Assume that. They're always useful, especially given how easy it is to write them and how easy Cargo makes it to run them. Documentation, again, everyone knows this. Just put some basic docs in the root, in the, on the types, on the methods, modules, obvious stuff, right? But if you're coming from another ecosystem, maybe it's not obvious to you that docs.rs grabs all of the crates from crates.io and builds the docs for them. This might be, well, this is definitely very different to a lot of other ecosystems. So if your documentation is crap, you're gonna have somebody coming along who's new to the ecosystem or the crate in particular and see just a bunch of type names that mean nothing, right? <coughs> and along with that kind of examples, this is uh, great for newcomers especially, but it also gives you a different uh, compile target which can catch things really early. It's kind of like a basic integration test kind of scenario. It emulates the application that consumes your library, which can catch like uh, missing exports and, and stuff like that. CI. If you're open sourcing this, uh, this crate, then basic CI is really easy, easy to add. Especially if you're using GitHub Actions, like this is what, 15 lines of something and you put it in a file and GitHub runs it for you. And you know that people, you know, the few people who are using your, your small crate are you know, do, doing it with some confidence. Um, Tiny gotcha, like the, the bottom two lines are necessary because apparently all targets and doc do not work together, which is a bit weird. Basic lint's also great. Um, these are the three that I put in every crate that I start. Um, some upgrade warnings, uh, some add, add new, uh, new errors. Um, I don't think there's any excuse to use non-standard styles, so that always goes in. And future incompatible is a fun one because it includes like 40 different lengths of things that might become hard errors in the future, um, which is uh, obviously something to, to watch out for, especially if you're only testing in CI in this really basic way. So, all right, you've got some users. And now you feel like stepping it up a bit, you know, you've got like 10,000 users, feeling pretty good about yourself. Um, although actually only 11% of crates on crates.io have reached version one. So it's, it's more like, you know, if you've, if you've reached a version like this, then, uh, you know, maybe you're getting somewhere. Uh, <laughs> examples of really big crates that haven't reached version one yet, and, you know, some, some people are shouting at them to really get there. This, this stuff matters. Like, Rand is one of the blessed crates that actually um, is run by the, the Rustlang organization. And even they're not at version one yet. So at this point, you really should be documenting what's changed. Because people are going to come, you know, you're not some scrappy project anymore. You want to, when you run Cargo Update, you see that there is a new version. You want to find out why. What is the new version for? And it doesn't really matter how you do this. Just write it down somehow, like this is ours. And we sort of try and document every new item and every change to every item. Um, it can be, you know, format it however you want. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as it's there. Shoot. Do you do that manually, also something like GitHub? Doesn't matter. Yeah, th there's plenty of tools to automate this. I'm, um, my personal appetite is towards handcrafted change logs. So yeah, this stuff, I write this stuff myself and require changes in merge requests to add this in, or I'll just do it myself. Um, but yeah, if you're comfortable with like requiring commit messages to be change log entries, then that's perfectly valid. I just, it's not my personal preference. Yeah, go. How do you keep track of what changes between versions? How do you keep track? As, like, as a maintainer, how do you go and make progress? Right. So uh, myself, I, I require entries in this if there's been a change to the public API in pull requests. Um, but if you're doing tagging as well, it's pretty easy to look at the diff between a, ta a tag and like the, the head, right? How do you do it, David? I think I do it exactly as you. All new PRs, they get a change log entry on this new version. And yeah. Just move all the unreleased fixes down to. Yeah, the exactly. But so good, we just do git log. Nice. <laughs> it's, it works. Like I look at your change logs like every every time, um, and they're very descriptive. You must require good commit messages. I mean, that's if you can do that, then great. Love it. Well, I, I can't even know why sometimes one time. 
Oh, okay, yeah. That's handcrafted, love it. <laughs> um, so yeah, more people are using your library now. Um, you need to really consider what dependencies that your library is using, because um, no man is an island. And the, the dependencies of your crate are called, uh, we generally call the upstream. And this matters, like the version of the upstream crates might matter to you for some reason, we'll get into that. They might have their own um, like preferences in terms of minimum supported Rust versions, and they definitely have their own dependency, dependency tree that might be bigger or smaller than you'd like. You also have to look at the other side of it, which is the downstream or your consumers. Uh, so we'll get into that. Figuring out what dependencies your crate should have is um, sometimes a bit weird. Like if all else is equal, I think you should just keep the dependency tree as small as possible. This is going to help everybody. This is going to reduce CI times for you, all of your downstream, and all of your like application consumers as well. Um, it's a, there's a frightening number of crates, in my opinion, that use the full fat futures crate, and even if they're just like using the stream trait, which is in futures core and is like dependencyless. If you're past version one, you really shouldn't um, expose pre-version 1 dependencies, which is a little bit of a sore topic for, for me in particular, because we, we do, but <laughs> if I had it my way, we wouldn't have done that. Um, and then you've obviously got to think about like ecosystem compatibilities can sometimes be implicit. Um, so things will compile fine, but there might be a, a runtime panic, right? So it, these examples of um, async runtimes and also like logging systems. I think these are technically compatible, but um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of examples of this, um, more that I couldn't think of when I was writing it. Minimum supported Rust versions. I mean, this is not at all a controversial topic, right? <laughs> We've had to deal with this in the past. Like, is it a breaking change to update your MSRV? It's weird, right? Like, how do you, how do you specify this as a crate author? If you're starting to use some, uh, if you're starting to use some new feature of Rust, how do you express that to your downstream? Because effectively, this is what your crate graph actually looks like. And everything has a version except for the standard library. So you start using something new in, in version 168, and your downstream is using 159. Like That's not going to be a good time. They're going to complain about that, potentially. Um, how do we? How do we express this? I mean, you can't just do this, right? This doesn't work because, you know, uh, Rust version 159 doesn't have access to the standard library of 165. How do you do it? Um, the more recent versions of Rust have this property, which you can put in your uh, cargo manifest. And it doesn't really help, but it certainly uh, gives you a more useful error uh, to the downstream consumers instead of um, seeing failures like, cannot use unstable feature X on stable, stable compiler. It'll just say, I don't know how to compile this. I guarantee you I can't compile this. It's tricky, right? And you've got to think about this and, and make sensible decisions when you're um, authoring crates to, to publish as libraries. Um, I, th I think we've generally centered around the idea that it's not a breaking change to update this, and we should also more or less keep the MSRV six at least six months or like three three or four like rust versions um, of support because realistically nobody in your downstream is going to be using rust 1.10 at this point surely um, the solutions to this going forward may or may not come to pass we'll see um, there's this idea of the an lts version of rust which would simplify things for us as crate authors um, because it, we'd have some like out of band agreement to always support this version. And when there is a new LTS, we can then say, oh yeah, there's a new LTS, I guess we'll all update at the same time. Um, that is our solution. It's not my favorite one. Um, my preferred solution to this is actually an MSLV aware cargo resolver, um, which it surprised me initially didn't come with the Rust version property in the manifest. Um, but like the way that this works is is a bit like is a bit like this. It kind of hides updates from you because it, it, it can read as long as the cargo version you're using understands the Rust version field in the manifest. It can understand that it can't compile it, right? 
So it can also, theoretically, decide to just choose an earlier version. So it's hiding updates from you. Um, I think the reason that this hasn't been implemented from the beginning is that uh, upstream crates might zigzag across the boundary um, and cause downstreams to require like an update anyway. Uh, so it's a, it's a little bit of a, a funny topic, but there's definitely issues for both of these ideas and work being done to improve this situation. Uh, additions, if you don't know, it's Rust's way of making breaking changes non-breaking by making them opt-in. And they're more or less related to MSRVs um, just because the, uh, the additions have a certain support, uh, min minimum support like version themselves. In general, like, I think at this point, just use version 2021. Uh, it depends for each edition whether you should update to it or not as a crate author. Um, for a long time, we were all really set on staying on 2018 as long as possible, but most people's MSRVs are now on like 1.60, so there's no point staying there. Uh, and you get a couple of nice things to go with that. So yeah, that's my recommend recommendation. So as your crate grows, you might want to support different things, and that's where feature flags, uh, feature flags come in. Uh, feature flags have a multitude of purposes. They can uh, reduce dependencies in your, uh, crate, in your dependency graph, unless downstream crates need them, and they can opt in. Right? And this is an example from the UUID crate. Uh, so by default, it doesn't require anything apart from the standard library, um, or anything else, I should say. But you can opt in to like the RNG stuff for version 4 and uh, the JS feature for things like WASM support. So this is a really great use of feature flags that you might want to start thinking about to reduce that crate um, dependency tree for the, the majority of cases, which will, again, speeds you up, speeds up your downstream. The other use of feature flags is uh, selecting between different um, backends or ecosystems of things, and this is an example from the Redis crate that has an async component, and they endeavor to support uh, both async std and uh, Tokyo as well. Um, but also they have different backends for the, uh, the TLS connection um, part. And this is a really useful technique, and you'll see a lot of, uh, a lot of crates utilize this uh, for, for the reasons we've outlined. In general, like non-additive uh, feature flags are, are problematic. Um, you should try and avoid them if it's all possible. It's really, it can be really hard sometimes. But if you um, if you have two features that conflict and cause compile errors, that's a problem. You should try and fix that if possible. So yeah, as you get bigger, you might want to expand your um, the quality of documentation, which I would recommend doing, and it's what I spent a lot of time doing after taking over Actix, uh, because they were garbage, and we <laughs> we just needed better docs, right? There was a lot of time spent figuring out um, how to explain a lot of these types to people, because it's a big it was a big ecosystem. One of the things you can do in terms of feature flags to make things easier for people is this handy new uh, auto doc config um, stuff, which generates the documentation on docs.rs in a really nice way so that it shows you exactly for each item in your API what feature you need to enable to get access to it, which is, I'm sure you've encountered this a lot of times and like a lot of the Tokyo guys have as well. Because, um, yeah, you guys are quite conservative with adding features in that, I don't know. I'm thinking about the JSON feature on request. <laughs> Um, and if, even then, you might want to require documentation at this point. Um, I sh that should say deny. But m for myself, I add this in right at the beginning almost, um, or add in the warn and then deny it in CI. Um, keeping the documentation up to date is really important for a, a larger crate, in my opinion. Um, I think we've, we've got a lot of big wins in terms of developer experience from just bolstering that documentation over time. All right, let's talk about breaking changes. Um, so we've explained in terms of the sem with the SEMBF quiz when a breaking change happens. Uh, for this case, we're just going to sort of consider um, post version 1 breaking changes. When is a change breaking? Any ideas? 
I was looking for literally always. Um, there's always going to be some poor schmuck, right, who's depending on a bug or depending on some like crazy setup. And if you even bump the patch version, it's going to break them in some test somewhere, right? This is going to happen. Uh, don't take it to heart. You know, if they file an issue and say your library's garbage, tell them you're holding it wrong, basically. Uh, <laughs> According to like the, the rest gives some guidance on this for, for library authors though. And uh, there isn't anything I, I want to really dive into here. Um, apart from that is to say this is a really good um, explanation of, of some things that cause breaking changes um, and a lot of things for uh, traits, functions, attributes as well. So it's, it's mostly obvious when uh, change will be breaking. It's less obvious sometimes with functions and uh, generics because if you're using a function as like a pointer, sometimes that can cause problems with required bounds down, down the line, which I don't think is mentioned in here, or it's not explained very well in, in this point. Uh, they also outline a couple of things that are possibly breaking, and this one is quite scary. Adding any inherent items to, uh, <laughs> to implementations, it's like, oh, of course, of course that's potentially breaking, um, which makes life, again, quite hard. But it really outlines the importance of, of tracking when uh, things are added to your public API and uh, what changes are being made to them. The question we actually want to answer is, when is a breaking change n not a major breaking change, or when it, when it is or when it isn't, right? Um, I've gratuitously stolen this code snippet from um, a great blog, blog post that I'll, I'll show you in a second, but this is uh, a little bit of a pop quiz for you guys. What happens if we are on comment line seven? Uh, no. <laughs> Cheat. Yeah, right. Um, Globs are evil. Don't use globs. Uh, imports, like, I don't care if you come from Java and they work fine. Doesn't matter. They don't work very well here. Um, so uh, I did steal, steal this code sample from uh, Predrag, and he's done a, a really remarkable job in, in the recent few months of documenting and filing issues against things like Rustdoc. Uh, for these real problems of glob imports causing issues um, when there's conflicting exports of a crate that are reasonably not compile errors, um, but could potentially affect your downstream users. Uh, the other one that I couldn't find a reference to in that list from the Rust docs is, uh, is this one, which is uh, another one of these like potentially break or it's not, it, this isn't a, a breaking major change, but it is a breaking change in some ways. Um, and it's to do with uh, if, the, if there's like a wrapper function for this bottom version that isn't able to infer what the type should be when it's passed in, then Rust will say, can't figure it out, sorry. Um, I think it's mainly to do with like into bounds on functions. Um, but the overall, opinion of when a breaking change is not a major breaking change is if you request that your downstream be more specific, then it's not major, right? If they actually typed out the full path to something, then it wouldn't have broken, then it's your fault, like as a downstream user. Uh, and that applies, yeah, to, to both this like glob import thing and the uh, infiltrate arguments. If you're uh, looking to avoid breaking changes, there's a couple of really useful techniques to, uh, to, to think about. If you're implementing, like, if, if you're deriving copy on a, on a struct uh, that only contains, like, a number, and you want to give that a name later, so you need to put a, um, a name field in there that's a string, yeah, that's, that copy implementation isn't going to work anymore. It, you cannot implement that, so that will be a breaking change because removing an implementation is going to break somebody down, downstream. Uh, I really like the static assertions crate um, for asserting that an implementation exists on a type. And this can be kind of insidious for things like auto, uh, auto traits, like send, uh, that you can sometimes just get lost 
um, because you're not the person implementing them. They're, they're automatically derived for a struct if all of the fields also uh, implement the trait. Uh, so that's a really handy, handy tip. I think there's some more uh, useful tools actually from Rust coming to catch things like this. But yeah, my experience so far has been static assertions. It's a great, great catch for this. Uh, yeah, builder patterns. I've, I've complained at a few libraries that just expose struct fields and then add to them. And it's like, you, you, you can't do that, right? I know you're new to Rust, but listen, you can't do that. Uh, so if you're, if you're thinking that you might need to add something to a struct and you want somebody to build that struct in your downstream, uh, builder types are a really great pattern for this. There's multiple flavors, so you can, uh, you, you can, you can do, what you, uh, do whichever one makes sense for the downstream. Um, the next point is really useful if you're wrapping unstable dependencies, like if you're trying to wrap some lower level, you know, system, uh, system library or some, some, uh, lower level behavior and they're exposing some, you know, enum, um, uh, that is like features of, of the, uh, of, of the library, whatever. It might seem like a pain, but don't just re-export that if you're like, post v1, because then that's putting something pre v1 in your public API. Um, it's much more uh, rusty to, to actually create an enum of your own and then have control over it so that you know whether a breaking change is happening to that enum. Return position infiltrate is one that I really love as a technique for um, avoiding breaking changes. And if you've used a web framework recently, you've probably seen this, although maybe not appreciated how useful this is in the uh, context of libraries. So, um, you know, this is a hello world for Access Web, and the handlers are returning an import responder, which is handy because you don't need to change that in order to just return something else, right? Super good. But in a library context, what we can do is have some implementation uh, method return, instead of a concrete type, you can return this impl trait. And that means that you can change anything about the concrete type underneath it, except for what's exposed in the public API, which is this bit, just that. That's the only thing you need to keep the same. You can add fields, you can, you can remove the lifetime, right? You can add new lifetimes, you can do whatever. And it gives you a lot more flexibility. Another area that's coming up or uh, has come up in some senses is um, using this simple trait in uh, associated types on traits. And this is something I've been excited for for a very, very long time because it's going to clean up this kind of stuff, <laughs> which has always been super horrible to me. Like, look at, look at this type. You know, this is warp level types here. And you can, if, if this just said, I want to return impl something that is, oh, I, I don't know, you know, has these specific parameters, then I can change the outer thing, which is ready here. I can change that to something else if, uh, if I really need to, if I'm adding some new feature to this middleware. And that's not a breaking change. Right now I'm stuck, right? Because if I want to change this, I have to create a new major version of, of Actis Web. And that's just, um, it's a, it's a handcuff that shouldn't need to exist and is, is becoming better over time. Yeah, if people are relying on you, you should try and automate all the things. So a couple of additional things to put in your CI, especially if you're using GitHub Actions. Um, take that MSRV that you chose and test on it. Run the test. It's really easy. Um, it's also a pretty good idea to test on either beta or nightly just for um, future uh, you, you're looking ahead a little bit, and you can set this to not fail the whole thing if um, if it fails, because sometimes it will just fail randomly, like especially nightly. Uh, you can start building and linting your documentation, which is, again is a win for your users. They'll love you for you know having links that actually link somewhere. For example, um, this doesn't include doc tests because they're included in uh, the testing stuff, but yeah, I think it's mainly just, uh, in my experience, it's called a lot of like linking errors, especially if you're using intra doc links and rename something. Uh, it'll go through and try and resolve the links before you actually publish it. And docs.rs is going to throw a hissy fit. So, all right, maybe you're ready. 
Maybe you're ready for the big V1.0, right? Unlike 98% unlike of crates on Crates.io. Um, when should you do this? It's basically a signal that I'm going to commit. I'm going to commit to you for a little while at least that I'm not going to break anything. And it's probably good enough to use in production, probably. Um, but listen, I'm not going to be scared of V2 either. It's important. You do that, life's good for a while. Um, people start using your library, right? You have great docs, they have great examples. People love you. People write blog posts about your library. And then other people read those blog posts and they come and use your library and check out your beautiful documentation. And then you're, before you know it, you're at a million downloads. Like what next, right? What next? For goodness sake, get somebody else on the team. <laughs> you need a team now. Um, people are relying on you and forks are rarely the way of, of sustaining um, an abandoned library. If you get hit by a bus, God forbid, um, even if it's just like a friend who isn't even a developer, just give them a GitHub account and say, look, have ownership of this, of this crate so that if I die, you can you know, pass it on. I don't think wills cover open source repos. So. Um, Increase your bus factor, and this is something that I have been trying to do, and it's the reason that I own the tiny map crate, despite it being a, you know, ti <laughs> tiny. <laughs> like, Who getting on. Hmm? Who got run over? <laughs> it could be any number of reasons. It could be far less dramatic than getting hit by a bus, right? You could get bored of it. You could lose access to the account. You could get hacked, right? Um, all of these things are possible reasons for a crate to never get updated again. And you want somebody who is able to just take it and assign a new owner uh, if anybody is willing to do so. Which if there's a million downloads, let's say, someone's probably going to be willing to do that. Um, I'm not chilling my GitHub sponsor here, but it's been a fantastic way of, of understanding the support that um, the community around your crates have for it. Um, I think what, what I mean about that is it was really easy to set up. It's not a, a salary, but it does signal that people use it and people care about its existence. And if you're in the same situation, in a, a position where you need to step away from it, you can then funnel some of that money to them if it's an incentive for them. right? Um, so as you get bigger, as you as you scale scale your uh, community around your your library crate, getting some monetary help is is a really good idea. Maybe you're too big. Maybe you just split it up a bit. And like I said, the Actix Web uh, ecosystem of crates was something like twenty. So like, why it could all be one, right? Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, the reasons that you might split a crate up when you get this to this size. Parts of it might be useful by itself. So for example, uh, one of the pieces we had was called local, it was like a, a, a non-thread safe channel implementation, which we split out into a crate called local channel. And for various reasons, it just seemed like a really uh, logical thing to split out because it was useful to other people potentially. Uh, Small and the async studs guys are really sort of famous for doing this. They own a frightening number of async prefix crates. Uh, that's fine. They take good care of them. Uh, isolating behavior. I mean, this is pretty self-explanatory, but it's often used to isolate unsafe behavior in particular for auditing reasons. And that can be really important for uh, the trust of your downstream, especially if they're using something like Cargo Geiger, to look into their dependency tree for things that have been audited in, in terms of unsafe. Um, reducing compile times for parts that don't need to be rebuilt too often. This is a great strategy. Um, just split that out, have it sit there cached, and then the layers on top of that that you um, have split out can uh, utilize the, um, the, the lower compile times. This is good for you, this is good for your CI, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of my passion projects a little bit last year was the uh, Actix Web Lab Crate because I was feeling really um, handcuffed by this major version. And I wanted to experiment with the, I think it was the redirect responder. 
uh, which would just, I guess, fill in the response with redirect headers and stuff like that. But I didn't really know if the design of the API and the pull request was good, uh, if this was stable enough to put into uh, a really widely used uh, yeah, library. So the lab was a really great place to experiment with that API design in a way that I've <laughs> done the opposite and promised that it will never be stable. Like I just bump those versions every day almost sometimes. Um, so it's really, it's much easier to experiment with, um, with crates if you split part of them out. Similar to the uh, uh, partial stabilization story, actually, um, Tokyo did this really famously. They got rid of all their like stream implementations and stuff because that would have impacted their public API in a negative way. So Tokyo had Tokyo Stream, Tokyo Util, and these are all pre-V1 so that they can experiment, right? Until they're happy with the API and uh, Hype is doing the same thing uh, coming up. So yeah, you split it up and just to say like, when you get this big, repos themselves, like workspaces of crates can become a level of um, encapsulation. So this one contains all of the things to do with HTTP and the other related specs and the application builders and stuff like that. Um, and there's also ActixNet, which contains everything lower than HTTP. Um, it was, it was, this is a great idea, and I think the, the decision of which crates go in which repo is just what is your level of encapsulation? And I guess most projects don't need this many crates to manage. Maybe it's negative for us that we manage so many crates, and I, I think that is partially true, um, especially when you start looking at the combined dependency graph, <laughs> which does, you, yeah. It's, it's easier to manage uh, these two like smaller units. Um, the other advantage of splitting up crates, right, is that if you make a change to something like, in this example, uh, the Actic service crate on, on the left, then you can immediately see what effects that will have on the, on the upstream uh, internal dependencies immediately. Like CI will start failing. So then you know, oh crap, right, need to, need to fix that, or maybe that's what you want, and you can update these dependencies at the same time. Uh, and then, yeah, this other just example of encaps encapsulation is everything above HTTP, the like pre-built blocks for applications uh, the, to reduce boilerplate. Anyway, so like at this point, you, you really want to bolster your CI up to the point where you just can't make mistakes with this stuff. You want to be able to give your downstream assurances that things aren't going to break. And there's a couple of useful tools for doing this. Um, the best one of it on this list for me is really just Cargo Hack, which is a brilliant tool. Um, but it has this flag feature power set, which will go through every combination of features and try them together uh, without you having to write them all out. Um, so if you're not using features that conflict with each other and cause errors, this is just going to catch a whole host of errors um, for certain sets of features. Um, I'm not sure what the consensus is on Cargo Public API and Carve Assembly Checks. Uh, both are having a lot of work done. Uh, but this is a really great way of seeing in CI what's changed without having to figure it out yourself. Other things when you've gotten big, especially if you're, uh, if, if you're implementing some lower level stuff, is test on all of the platforms that you want to support and it's really, it's, uh, I missed putting the, the, the little code snippet in, but it's just as easy as testing on the uh, different versions of Rust, just as easy. Minimal versions also, uh, I wouldn't recommend this check just yet. It's, um, it's really finicky because it will break if any of your upstream does this wrong. Uh, but again, there's like work being done to make sure that the minimal version requirements that you put in your cargo manifest are accurate, as in, you're not using something from a later version and saying, oh, I can use an earlier version, um, which is a bit of a pet peeve of mine, but nobody seems to, it doesn't seem to affect many things in practice because cargo update usually increases versions and not decreases them. And then if you want to get really fancy, you can start looking at like automatic releases, which will just publish things with auto-generated change logs and, and whatever. This isn't my cup of tea, but I thought I'd put it in. Um, just so, uh, just so you know, I know there's been a lot of work done on, on this project in particular. So yeah, go check it out. Um, 
And I think that's probably, oh, this is this slide's a bit weird, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's that's all you need to know about like growing a crate from zero to ten billion downloads or whatever. Um, so yeah, any any questions about that stuff or anything else really? <sighs> yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's all uh, Shoot. Is there any good way to like handle the platform like specific crates? Uh, sorry, is there any good way of handling platform specific crates? Yeah, for example, like if you like, take EPO or something, right? Sure. If you try to compile this on Mac, yep. it's gonna like fail with importing some GPC stuff, right? Yep, I think the uh, the strategy around that is having the specification in the manifest that only compile this on a specific target. Okay. Um, pretty sure, right? You guys do a lot more of that than I do. Like with Mio. I mean, in your Kraken toggle, yeah. you can say like, this dependency should only apply if this config combination happens. So you can do config windows. Yeah. But I, I think you can also do stuff like say, if this is not on Windows, then this crate is just empty and compiles. Oh, interesting, yeah. So you don't get compile errors, but it's just useless. That's a good strategy. So there's a, an extension to the manifest format that allows you to scope dependencies to config items, and one of these is what platform you're on, which is a distinct thing from feature flags, uh, which makes it automatic. Like these are feature flags inserted by cargo. So as a maintainer of a very popular crate, how do you handle when a competing library <laughs> overtakes you in stars? <laughs> Um, Next question. <laughs> in stars. In GitHub stars. In GitHub stars. I don't know. I guess I'll find out when it happens. <laughs> they overtook it. They overtook in downloads. Downloads. Yeah, yeah. But that's because they. That's because Tonic uses the the router. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's called insider trading, my dude. <laughs> Cool. All right. I'm out of here. Any, any non-confrontational questions? Non-confrontational. Non-related to the war between frameworks? <laughs> oh, there's one there. Are you making the slides available? Am I making the slides available? Sure. I don't know how. I've never done that before, but OK. <laughs> Where do people put we slides? We have a recording too now. <laughs> we might have a recording. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't promise anything. Did you take it to the room? All right. Righty-o. Uh,